Hello, and welcome back to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today, we've got my great friend, Rich Vaughan. Hello. Hello. Rich is an attorney in the United States and bar licensed in multiple states. We've got California, New York, Illinois. You're about to do... Texas. And... Colorado. So that's five states that you can practice in yourself and then your company is us wide as well right correct yeah um one of the things that that has come out in the press very recently is a court ruling in alabama now as an international intended parent how does that affect us well the first thing that intended parents from other countries need to understand about the u.s is that family law in the u.s is state by state right it's not federal so <clears throat> this ruling in Alabama uh, is strictly limited to Alabama. Okay. So um, that's the first thing to understand about it. Second thing is that there could be ripple effects from that. And so that's what we're all sort of talking about. And that's why there's such a huge uproar um, uh, and backlash, if you will, against mm -hmm. the ruling that was issued. Um, what do you mean by ripple effect? Since the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in the Dobbs case in June of 2022. What's Dobbs? That, well, Dobbs was the case that overturned Roe v. Wade. And Roe v. Wade was our court ruling from 1973 that basically created the right to an abortion. Okay. So Roe versus Wade is the right to have an abortion. Dobbs was taking that away. And saying that there was no right of privacy in the U.S. Constitution that guaranteed a right to an abortion, that this was not a federal issue. Okay. It is a state issue. So once the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade, abortion now became a state-by-state -state issue. Oh, okay. So abortion was a, a, a countrywide right, and then they took that away so that each state could make its own law around abortion. Correct. And so that's connected to this <laughs> recent ruling in the sense that the anti-abortion movement is continuously and has been for decades been looking at how to define life at the earliest possible moment and then make it in, you know, a, a crime to abort. Okay. And so the, the, the two are connected because if you now go back in time in a pregnancy to when the embryo is created at fertilization, which is what was the center of this ruling, then they are kind of connected. So the concern is that you've got the Alabama ruling, but will it stop there? Will some other state try to do the same thing? Almost like a contagion effect of one state's done it, so another conservative state can do it as well. Correct. Okay, cool. So the ruling has said what exactly? So the Alabama case is, is it's called LePage versus the Mobile Infirmary Clinic. And what happened at the core of the case was this was in a hospital. A mental health patient got loose, found their way into the room where the cryotank was located, opened up the cryotank, grabbed some embryos. Of course, freezer burned the you-know-what out of his hand. Yeah. Uh, and dropped the embryos. Because you know, they're stored at right. super cold Negative temperature. Negative 360 yeah. degrees or whatever it is. Yeah. So... Um, the embryos were destroyed. Right. right. So the patients whose embryos were destroyed sued the clinic. And among their multiple causes of action in their lawsuit, one was a wrongful death claim to say that they these embryos should be considered children so that they could have a claim under the Alabama wrongful death statute. Right. So the case went to trial. The trial court said, no, embryos are not children. You cannot prevail on this particular claim. There were other claims, of course, but this was the one that, that got appealed. Uh, so the trial court said no, it got appealed, and the appellate court said no, and then it eventually went to the Supreme Court of Alabama, and Alabama Supreme Court said, oh, yes, by the way, yes, embryos are children for purposes of the Alabama wrongful death statute. And wow. in the ruling, there was a lot of biblical terminology and references so it, there was a very clear right-wing conservative bent to this particular court yeah. and, and the con, uh, um, concurring judges. 
So a lot of separation of church and state going on in Alabama, right? <laughs> none. 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 You know, this judge, <laughs> look, we're all entitled to our opinions and religious beliefs and all of that, but this judge really belongs in a church, not, not in a courtroom. That's my opinion. I'll, I'll say that out loud <laughs> many times. <laughs> so therefore, we have now a ruling in Alabama that is saying that embryos are children. So I have a question, right? So I have embryos stored at the clinic in California. But the California law is different to Alabama law because it's now state by state. So my embryos are okay thus far? Your embryos are fine. Yeah. If your clinic is not in California, is not in Alabama, you are perfectly fine. There's, there's no concern in any other state. At the moment. At the moment. Okay. With, with some exceptions. I, I can talk about those if time permits. But Yeah. So then if we're in Alabama and I'm going into my IVF clinic, like they, how is that working? Well, rather quickly after the ruling, there were three out of the five clinics in Alabama that, that stopped all services. Stopped. Stopped. All services relating to anything IVF out of concern for liability. I mean, this, this, this raises the stakes for IVF, right? The liability exists everywhere because there are multiple points along the IVF pathway when you could lose an embryo accidentally. An embryo could freeze to the side of the pipette and never come out. Um, you could lose it in PGD testing. Um, it could be you know, lost in any biopsies. So anytime you lose an embryo now in Alabama, based on this ruling, you are now subject to liability under the wrongful death statute. Which just blows my mind. Quite outrageous. So then let's elaborate a little bit on that. So say, for example, the clinic has thawed an embryo, transferred it into a surrogate, and then she miscarries. Is that, are we just talking about the embryos now, or is this now a miscarriage turning into some form of liability to the surrogate or a, a miscarriage is, is sort of a natural end to a pregnancy that you, there's nothing that this ruling touches in okay. regard to miscarriage so okay it, fine so it's l just concerning the embryos and how that all works um so what does that mean i guess so the liability that we you just touched upon what does that mean for the people working in the clinics i mean will they be held liable for wrongful death if there is a an embryo that doesn't work for or technically speaking yes oh my god they are liable the clinic itself is liable uh, depending on how the clinic is set up as a corporation perhaps maybe the individual employees are shielded but the clinic will be liable any com and th there were some patients that were actually looking into transporting their embryos out of Alabama right into other clinics and the transportation companies were refusing because they would be liable correct it's quite wide reaching isn't it so what what do you think is going to happen next well this raises the stakes quite a bit um, and uh, there is concern about whether IVF is the next sort of battlefront in the anti-abortion movement we have we have good reason to believe that it won't be, um, and some of that is due in part to the reaction we've seen mm -hmm. among even conservative and Republican legislatures around the country um, because we have you know, uh, a lot of support for creating families, a lot of support for IVF. You know, so, but, but the concern is you know, how do we protect it? Yeah. And how do we protect IVF from here? And the people practicing the IVF. How do you not only protect the IVF, but the people working in that field? Correct. How do you protect the, the, the folks working in the industry, in the field, and how do you protect the patients and you know, just preserve everyone's ability to, to form families and, and keep costs down as well? Because, of course, if, if this ruling were to stand without any um, action by the legislature, which we should talk about, um, then the liability would be so great that the costs would go up and you basically make IVF inaccessible in Alabama. And the costs would go up because you have to have an insurance for the liability, and then that just makes it prohibitive. Correct. Even in Alabama, there was backlash against the ruling. Uh, 
amongst the legislature there. And the, uh, the House and the Senate in Alabama quickly went to work on two different bills to protect IVF. And it appears as of today that uh, there was unanimous passage in both the Alabama House and the Alabama Senate. The two bills are slightly different. They need to be reconciled, but there's a lot of support behind getting those reconciled, and it looks like there will be a bill going to the governor next week to be signed to protect IVF in Alabama. So how does the law work? So you've got, I think this is where I'm getting confused a little bit. So you've got the Supreme Court have passed a judgment saying embryos are children. Then that has to be signed into law by... So great question, especially for (laughs) non-U.S. Like I have no idea how that works. (laughs) Right. For a non-U.S. intended parent, I guess the, the, the quick summary of how the system works yeah. in the U.S. is when when people have a dispute, a problem that they need to solve through court, they'll go to court and get a ruling and maybe appeal it, and it goes up to the Supreme Court if it's that serious of an issue and the Supreme Court wants to take it. So when a court rules, they're ruling on something very specific, this specific dispute. And you can apply logic to this ruling and saying, well, this will apply to all kinds of other situations. So if we get other similar situations, the ruling would, the result would be the same. So you have some indication of what the court ruling would be if you had another claim to bring in a different case. Separately, so, so, so that's case law. Okay. Separately, we have legislative law. And when the courts are involved in resolving disputes or, or, ruling on a dispute in such a way that legislatures don't agree with. The legislators have the power to create written legislation that then overrules the court or clarifies something that the court ruling left ambiguous. Right. So that's what's happened here in Alabama. The legislators have all gotten together to say, no, we want to protect IVF Mm -hmm. because that was the consequence of the ruling. Um, So, They've, they've said, look, we want to protect IVF. So that will clarify one piece of the quagmire that was created by the court ruling. It doesn't solve everything because yeah. from what I understand, this, this, these bills in Alabama um, are not going so far as to say that embryos are not children. They're simply carving out an exception for IVF. Okay, so, so the, the case the case that went through, that still stands. That That's good. The legislature is then going to say, okay, but this is what actually we can carve out within a legal framework. Correct. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, so complicated. We had the same thing in California back in the early 1990s when surrogacy was first um, starting um, where there were some disputes over parentage of a child mm-hmm. when a surrogate changed her mind and the case went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't change your mind. This is a surrogacy case. Um, the intended parents are the parents, period, end of story. That was court ruling. That was a court ruling. And th- that happened several more times in California with the Supreme Court. But eventually California came up with legislation comprehensively addressing surrogacy and spelling out more of the details of what these contracts need to look like and what were the procedures for these contracts and so the legislation has the, through legislation you have the opportunity to more comprehensively address a situation okay uh, that, well, so that kind of makes sense you have ambiguity there are situations happening on a day-to-day basis and then it happens so many times that the, the law steps in and goes well we need to create something to clarify and codify and make sure that everything works as it should. Correct. I mean, the courts are supposed to be there just to interpret the laws. Right. So in Not the... Not write the laws. Correct. Correct. Well, and, and that's sort of what's happening with the U.S. Supreme Court. They're saying that Roe v. Wade was court-created right. law when it really should be up to the states to decide abortion. So that's basically yeah. the, the quick summary of, of the Dobbs ruling in, in June of 22. Okay. So what we've seen here, speaking of ripple effects, which I mentioned earlier, um, it it appears that Tennessee and Virginia are also considering similar bills to protect IVF. Bills to protect IVF, not bills to make embryos children. Correct. 
Okay, correct. And and that's out of concern for I'm looking for the right somewhat respectful adjective. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the concern from the really strong and well-backed and strategical anti-abortion movement that has been going on for 50 years. And that includes the political aspects of getting judges in place and legislators in place who are all very anti-abortion. So now you've got all these judges in place who might rule like this judge did in Alabama. So the concern is we don't want that to happen. We don't want this to go too far. Right. We want to... We want to protect people's right to have families through IVF, you know, infertility, through a number of measures affects one in six people. So we don't want to make right. IVF illegal or impossible. Right. So the legislature is preemptively putting in place stuff, which is what they should be doing. Correct. Really. Correct. Now, there has been a similar type of bill proposed um, by Senator Tammy Duckworth on a federal level to protect IVF federally, and that has been blocked. Yeah, of by, course. You know, a conservative Republican senator. Um, it she's presented this bill several years several years in a row, and, and it's been blocked every single time. Yeah. So there could be there could be a federal fix on this, but it doesn't look like we quite have the support for it just yet. Okay. But maybe, maybe you know, this ruling and the backlash creates an opportunity, it opens a door. So can we touch a little bit about? the abortion debate as well because i think for us internationally like we believe in a woman's right to choose and like that's in a lot of countries and i I specifically think that who am i to tell someone what they can and can't do with their own body can you explain how it's working in the states and elaborate a little bit on again state by state or federally or all those different things so do you mean in the context of, of abortion generally or in specific how it relates to assisted reproduction? I guess both. Okay. So after the Supreme Court ruling in June of 2022 in the Dobbs case, um, which removed a federal, what we thought was a federal right to an abortion, now each state has its ability to create its own abortion law. There were in a number of states trigger laws that had been passed years ago that said if the Supreme Court ever overturns Roe, we automatically go back. So they had preemptively put in place stuff to say if this ever changes, we can immediately do what? Uh, Have an anti-abortion statute in the state. There were other states, and many of those trigger laws have become new anti-abortion laws in those states. And we have a number of states that are uh, not friendly to abortion and that will ban it outright or ban it at six weeks or at 12 weeks. So there's a a patchwork of anti-abortion laws and um, abortion restrictions from state to state. There are also a number of states who have gone the other direction to affirmatively state that, yes, we are pro-choice in this state. You can come to this state if you live in a conservative state with a restrictive abortion law you can come to this state for your procedure if you need it and how does that filter into surrogacy and assisted reproduction so in any surrogacy arrangement there's always a discussion about abortion and selective reduction uh, for the the sake of the discussion for today and for the the contracts that are parties are signing they're addressing these issues in case they come up Uh, they're fairly rare Fortunately, but they do still happen. These situations do still happen. And you know, there may be a need for a reduction or an abortion due to some issue with the surrogate's health. Right. If she's in danger, if her health or life are in danger, she has the right to make a decision. Um, that's at least how we, we look at it in, in the assisted reproduction world. If she lives in a state that doesn't allow it, then she would be able to travel to another state for the procedure. If the issue is not one of her health or life, but there's some sort of defect or abnormality or serious problem with the baby, then if the parties have discussed it and agreed that the parents have the right to make the decision on what to do, that gets reflected in in the surrogacy contract. But in all of these contracts now, I mean, since, since 2016, we've had provisions 
in the agreement that allows the surrogate to travel for the procedure. And everyone has the right in the U.S. to travel. That's a constitutional right. That's not, it's not subject to any scrutiny right now. It's not going to be overturned or taken away. So even if um, there's a super, super restrictive abortion law like in Texas or in Alabama, and they have to consider an abortion, um, the surrogate is allowed to travel. So have you seen a decrease in surrogates doing undergoing pregnancies and undergoing surrogacy processes in places like Texas? There was a temporary pause, of course, yeah. while everybody stopped to figure out what was going on, and yeah. what the law really was, and what the restrictions were, and if there were any um, out clauses, if you will, in this case, the right to travel ex does exist. Uh, but no, it's been steady as she goes so as an intended parent like if, I, if somebody presents me with a surrogate in texas i i don't have to worry you don't have to worry okay great currently if they present me with someone in alabama maybe right. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta worry i don't think you have to worry i think you until i would wait and, and see what happens wait with this legislation let's just wait a little bit hopefully that'll be all solved next week there is something interesting about this Alabama legislation that I wanted to point out. From what I understand, the bill, if passed, would automatically be repealed in one year. So the protection for IVF clinics and people, that would disappear after a year? Correct. Now, presumably, this is to give the legislators time to craft a more thoughtful, more comprehensive bill that addresses more or all of the of the issues possibly okay. and this is a complicated area it touches on many many things so uh, theoretically the, the the work will continue to create better legislation and there will be debates and discussions and revisions and politicking yeah. between now and the end of that one year i guess that could be quite an interesting thing for lawyers to get involved with because if you can use that to benchmark into other states best practice that could help it could like i said earlier we have a, an opportunity here there's a door being opened to looking into this with a bit more specificity on a, on a particular issue that we need to address yeah so I, I would love to see more bills of this type where we explain what's protected and why it's protected and we and we get behind it and, and support it and defend it Okay, well, you're, you're bar licensed in five states, so I expect to see <laughs> legislation being promoted by Rich Vaughan. <laughs> I'll get to work right away, <laughs> right away. Well, Rich, thank you so much for, for explaining that, because for you know, us internationally, it's really quite complicated, and sometimes we, th we see these things and we get scared. We're like, what does that mean to us? Because it's so different to our day-to-day -day life. So thank you for kind of dumbing it down for me so that I can understand it. And um, thanks for being on the podcast today. My pleasure.